Halito Chukma. I'm Lead Tracker E. This is the first segment of a new video series we will be presenting that we have entitled Standing Feather Stories, in which I will interview the Bigfoot expert Jerry Leadhorse Williams, a medicine man and Native American elder. Jerry, I thought a great place to start is to have you explain why we chose the title Standing Feather Stories. Well, that is a story in itself. Back in 2009, Obama had stated that all the original people, some people know us as Native Americans, had to have a passport. So in 2009, I traveled by bus, many buses, to Maine to test and to cross the Canadian border is what they call it. I reach my goal, destination. There's a bridge there that you have to cross that is uh, uh, is across the river, a very big river. So on the other side, I was denied access, even though I had the proper identification at that time, before the passports. So being denied, I had to walk back across the, uh, the bridge there was a man who pulled up in a car. <clears throat> he uh, walked into the building that I was walking by, which is a border checkpoint area. And he came out and upon seeing me, he seen me walking, so he went in and came out. So by the time I got um, close to the building, he, he was out. He said, hey, how you doing? And I said the same. And then he asked me where, where I was from. And I said, I'm uh, Oklahoma, Choctaw, Mississippi. Um, and we talked for a little bit. Then a reporter came over who was at the border on that day. She was also looking for a story about that day because this is the day that passports had to be issued. You had to have a passport to cross today. But the reporter asked where I was from also. After the interview, which I stated that our people do not need passports, we are home. Only the people who are not from here need a passport. After the interview, and you can find that, that is uh, Choctaw Test Passport in Callis, Maine, C-A-I-L-I-S, Maine. The young man asked me where I was staying. Uh, which I replied that I had no plans on staying. I was just going to come across and then go back. But now I had, uh, I had to stay now. I still had to cross that border somehow. So I went, so he asked me if I wanted to uh, uh, ride with him to his reservation, which was about 15 miles. And it's the nearest reservation in, in that area. And to me, that's a safe place as far as reservations with Indians. So I journeyed with this young man. He dropped me off at this house where he said, it's only $5 a night, but it's, only, but it's for like visitors or people in need. So he dropped me off and I paid for three days. I didn't think I'd be staying there that long, but I wanted to make sure I had a place to stay if I had to. Got settled in, and the next morning, I went to go look for my way to cross that river. But it's an ocean inlet area. So that next morning, I was going up and down the coast. I finally found one small bottleneck area, but saying small, I'm, I'm meaning it is it's huge. But it was the smallest area that you could cross. Well, I started guesstimating it and calculating with the wind current with the water current that if i get in in this side swimming across that current i should be able to get over to this side to this piece of land but if i missed i would have been swept out to sea or I swept out to the ocean so I was looking for driftwood and things like that to use to cross. I found some. 
but I still wanted to go and look at other options, other places. So I traveled uh, up the coast, which was still near the reservation. And that is the Passamaquoddy Reservation, P-A-S-S-O-M-Q-U-O-D-D-Y, also called Pleasant Point. It's in Maine. You'll, if you look that up, you'll find that. So I walked, and I couldn't find any places, any place smaller than that. But I did see a little little uh, uh, mountain, a little top that overlooked everything. And I knew that if I could get up there, that I would be able to see the entire area, survey, find another spot, and proceed that way. When I, when I followed a deer trail and a little trail up, got up to the top of there, when I seen the vastness, and I could see the ocean, I could see the inlet far down there, but that inlet was the only option I could see. There was no way to cross the wide open, and that was the only way that I could see crossing. So that was the option that I had. So I began to pray. And I was just asking for a little help, a little nudge, just to, and if I had to cross that river that way, or, or the ocean inlet that way, that I would just be protected or guided enough just to at least hit that end. And so uh, I said my prayers, thank the creation, thank God, turned around and walked down and took that same path down. I'm heading back to where I was staying to get some rest because the next day or two, I was going to have to try to cross that river. So on my way back down the mountain, in the same path, when I got down to the base or the foot of it, there was an eagle feather sticking straight up. Now, that feather wasn't there going up. The same path coming down. So I picked it up and I looked at it. Beautiful feather, perfect feather. And I'm looking at it. So I said, okay, okay. I got the answer. So uh, the village of the past McCoy wasn't real far from there. So I went over there to see if I could get some help. Someone could have a boat, canoe, or a car, or something. Or someone may know someone at the border. And it wasn't for anything illegal. It was just to get over there, just to prove a point and get back. The uh, I, I met a family that was outside. Kids were playing as, as I was walking by. And the kids noticed me and they said hello and I said hello to them. Then the parents came out and I began talking with them a little bit. Once they found out I was Choctaw from Oklahoma, um, you could see like a relief or something. Now we're friends. Now we're now we're family. And so I was explaining to the family that I needed to get across and why I'm there and how far I came. So they said, well, I know a guy that can probably help you. Uh, he lives a couple houses down. His name's Red Crow. And also Indian names are different. Um, uh, but everyone, then an ordinary name. <laughs> so I went over to Red Crow's house knocked on the door and Red Crow yelled out come on in so I opened the door and came in and when he seen me that's when he goes whoa 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 because he had never seen me he was expecting someone from the neighborhood uh, from the village and I'm I'm not you know from there so we started talking a little bit and uh, he was laughing about me coming in and him not knowing who I was and how easy it was that he he was naturally saying come on in but he didn't have a boat <clears throat> but he did say there is another man that may be able to help you uh, his name's Wolf and if you go around this corner he's got a, a big yard over there and he should be able to help you so I thank Red Crow for his uh, guidance and this is all orchestrated this is a divine orchestration the way everything's happening 
And so I go over, I walk over to Wolf's house. And I'm carrying my eagle feather, my long hair is down. I open his gate and I walk to his front door. I knock on the door and he goes, yeah. And I said, Wolf. And he goes, yeah. He said, come on in. I said, all right. So I came on in, I opened the door up and I said, Wolf, I need your help. And he said, you got it. Don't worry about it. You got it. I said, thank you. <laughs> and he said, so uh, where are you from? Uh, how are you? And then we actually, we got to the conversation where I'm from, what I'm doing there. Uh, and he's also feed me. He's giving me food. He's like, come and eat. Here's some water. Here's some juice. So we're eating while we're talking. And um, he just bust out laughing for a second there. And I was going, you know, uh, I didn't know what he was laughing at. So I was like, okay, you know. He said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I just have to, I had to laugh because I have to tell you this. And I said, okay. He said, when you walked from my gate to my front door, I have a big window pane window. And when you walked in front of that big window, that window pane, long hair, brown skin, carrying an eagle feather, I thought you was a spirit. So it didn't matter what you said, what you were there for, I was going to help you, I was going to give you whatever you needed, I was, you know, and I, we, we laughed at that for a little bit, and um, I told him about going up to the mountain, I told him about the eagle feather, and on, right before he was going to give me a ride back to where I was staying, he asked me if I wanted to go to a sweat lodge tomorrow at 3 p.m., I said, yeah, I'll go with you. Um, I, you know, I, in ceremonies, I do a lot of ceremonies. And sweats are one of the ceremonies that I teach. The, uh, the young man, or his name is Wolf, picked me up the next day. Uh, it was about 1 o'clock. We went there to get there a little bit earlier. <clears throat> it was in the open field. There's eagles flying around. This is like a protected area that they have. So he said, but we're in the, the truck, and he he asked me if I can uh, wait there for a second, which I had no problem with that. But what I did know was that this was a warrior sweat that I was being invited to. Not just any kind of warrior sweat. These were warriors. They were past McCordy, Penobscot, Lakota, Kiowa, different tribes, Mohawk, uh, Seneca, different tribes were coming together to meet just for this warrior sweat which as the orchestration goes I just happen to be there at that same time it's all falling together so I see a young man who's got the smudge uh, bucket smudge pail it's a rusted pail that they carry and it's got a cedar in it and they smudge the whole area they use the cedar to keep off and ward off the evil spirits or the evilness or the negativity and so that's his job. But I could see Wolf talking to him. And he's looking at me in the car. And he's looking at Wolf and looking back. Looking. And then the Wolf comes over to the car. And he said, okay, everything's good. Uh, we can go. So, you know, I grab my eagle feather. Because you always take your sacred ceremonial items with you to each ceremony. So that they get the ceremony energy also. The good energies. The young man is waiting for me. And it's like an invisible barrier gate kind of thing. You could just feel that once you cross here, you're in. But they were standing right at that thing with the, the smudge pail. I uh, walked up to him and said hello to him. And he goes, Wolf was telling me uh, a story about you. And and I was just wanting to ask you a couple of questions. And I said, okay. And he said, uh. They told me that you found an eagle feather. I said, yeah. I said, uh, I went up and prayed on the mountain tip. And when I came down, the eagle feather was there. And he said, well, can you tell me 
Was it laying on its back? Was it laying on the top? Was it pointed east? Was it pointed west? How was it? And I said, well, it was sticking straight up in the air. It was sticking, it, I mean, it was just right in the grass. It looked like somebody just stuck it in the ground. And it was there, so I picked it up, and this is the feather. He said, the reason I'm asking you is because I had a dream last night. And in that dream, it showed me a man who was holding a feather, a standing feather. And he said, that standing feather, that person will stand for his people. And he said, I'm glad you're here. The dream that I had last night, and you're here today, that it's all making sense now. We had a great warrior sweat. That was the hottest sweat I've ever been in. Different warriors from different areas. In every round, what they call rounds, um, you can get air or whatever and go out and cool off. But for the warrior sweat, and it was hot in there, the higher you go, um, the hotter it gets. That's why in sweats you'll see people laying down or, or near the small openings trying to get cool and you'll see a lot of people do that and you never lay on your back you always if you have to lay down you lay on your stomach you never turn your back on earth you always you're always up that is also the warrior sweat that that was also the time that i just quit drinking uh before that you know i would have drinks from time to time but now in this sweat, we talked, all the warriors talked from different nations, that if we're going to be helping the people, if we're going to be those warriors, we can't be drinking. We can't be on drugs or anything like that. We have to be on call 24-7. We all agreed to that. It was a powerful sweat. And after each round, the head man would say, let's stand up and take some heat for the people and this was a hot hot sweat down low but every round we would get up you couldn't stand up completely you had to kind of hunch over just a hair but you it felt like you was standing right in a or on a branding iron or something it was so hot in there you could feel the heat just felt like it's almost baking you it was so hot and we did that for each round. We, uh, we agreed that to be warriors for the people, that we had to be on call 24 seven. We couldn't be at a bar. We couldn't be drinking. We couldn't be doing anything that would stop us from being on call. And I've been that way ever since. But that was the time of the standing feather. And many warriors and many nations know about that feather. And I still carry it today. <laughs> and I do stand for my people. But I also stand for all people. This is not something that in the times that we're in, everyone is needed. The racism, the disagreements, the separation. We have to all come together for this. Everyone has to know exactly what everyone else knows. Everyone has to have the same information, the same knowledge. And we were told that before. That if people want to survive with us, with what's coming, we have to tell them everything. We have to give them our information. And that's what we're doing now.